very much, Rachel. And so, I'm, uh, mm, sorry, I'm jumping in too quickly. No, I was just saying, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Claire French, and I have just been completing a fellowship at the University of the Witwatersrand, which is in Johannesburg. But I also have an associate fellowship at the, um, the University of Warwick. And my research is on how to make multilingual performance without reproducing linguistic hegemonies. Um, it came from an ethical place, from me working in the rehearsal room and realizing that I was one of the only ones that was speaking English as a first language. And then I thought, okay, well, multilingualism can be a way that I can't ever control the work. And so that was my starting point. And now, eight years later, after researching it, um, mostly in South Africa, but also Australia and the UK, um, I, it's now moving a little bit more into thinking about dramaturgies and what um, the place of the spectator, the, the role of the spectator, really, in, 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 in making decisions around multilingualism. So that's where I've come from methodologies to dramaturgies. So it's kind of the harder place now because I have to actually think about the spectator. Brilliant. Th thank you very much. So thank you very much to our um, panellists for, for introducing themselves there. Just to say very quickly, um, as Cheryl has pointed out in the chat, the session is now being recorded. Um, so if anyone um, does not want to be seen on, on the camera, please obviously uh, switch your your camera off so you're not on the on the recording uh, but just to kind of let everyone know that for for people who are not able to be here with us now the session's being recorded so that they can kind of catch up later okay and um, so what i'd like to do now is is just hand over to our our panelists um so i'm assuming we're running this the same way that we have previously where we'll have um each of the panelists talking and then we'll have our our questions afterwards so um on the screen we've got kasha up first so would you like to to kick us yes. off and if everyone else can give a a warm welcome to thank you sorry can you hear me yeah 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 okay yeah perfect thank you this panel brings together our three voices as scholars and applied performance makers working in multilingual contexts to propose a multivocal and influxed model for engaging with multilingualism in applied context as an ethical approach to negotiating and representing the complex multilingual ecologies of the global South and North. In order to do so, we are exploring our own and other practices. We want to share and reflect on collaborative moments when actors catalyzed multilingualism in community practices across Africa, Europe and Oceania. If interests of interest are the specific sociocultural, political and economic influences on the shift from a dominant language to another less dominant, low status or minority language. These performance practices tackle big questions, including how individual linguistic limitations brought by facilitators into community spaces can be reflexively embedded into the project design, and how inherited institutional norms and policies can be overtly interwoven into group discussions, challenged through new discursive possibilities of play and improvisation. Sustainability is also central to a discussion which emphasizes the potentially damaging impacts of multilingual performance practices on reinforcing powerful attitudes towards language. As we reflect on multilingual performance practices that situate and challenge various nodes of power, we acknowledge that our own positions are not unproblematic. For a start, our own perspectives on different works are not methodologically uniform. The acuteness of our gazes looking at different contexts is not uniform. Our ears and brains' abilities to pick up frequencies of languages and their contexts are not uniform. And the model we are trying to propose is not uniform. It's multifocal, in flux, or to say it simply, it's rather messy. But this mess has a point. It speaks to asymmetries, tensions, and messiness that underpin multilingual contexts. To juxtapose the mess, we structured the panel into four parts. We will first discuss our theoretical framings and current gaps in knowledge and practice. Then on, we will explore techniques and methods for multilingual practices that are legitimizing difference and sustainable for an unpredictable future. 
They are careful in further managing participants' language practices. They curate process-based and body-centric methodologies as starting points for participants to catalyze multilingualism on their own terms. We arrange the order so it is applicable to diverse creative processes of applied practice, offering a flexible blueprint. First, set in Eastern European contexts, I will discuss the techniques that focus on giving up ideas of simplistic intelligibility and instead empowering self and others to fail in languages. This is an initial step of giving up of the pre preconceptions about language, of being in a language. Claire French, building on works from Johannesburg, South Africa, will explore techniques and methodologies to facilitate actors to stay to continue the circular process of being in the body and translanguaging. Finally, Rachel Jacobs, through an examination of multilingual performance-based education projects in the Western Sydney region of Australia, will speak about advancements in language that are enhanced by engagement of body in space and effective response. We already emphasize the lack of any uniformity in our methods, gazes, ability to hear. But here, once again, we want to emphasize that we are building this process based on very different in the broadest and deepest sense practices. What they have in common is that they are all different and that they facilitate what we called gość inność. This is based on a Polish translation of a word hospitality. Gościnność is made of two words. Gość, meaning guest as a noun, our host as an imperative verb, and inność, otherness. Polish eminent philosopher and scholar Cezary Wodziński proposes to write it as gościnność, so with hyphen. Spelled like this, gościnność also denotes an order to host otherness. Wodziński analyzes multiple languages and sources, and particularly Homer's Odyssey. Based on that, he argues that hosting of otherness within oneself and seeing oneself through a nomadic act of a constant change, w ruchu między ktoś a nikt, między nikt a ktoś, in a movement between someone and no one, between no one and someone, is the core of gościnność and a core of being human. In line with that, the discussed practices make a case for gościnność as a core quality of multilingual practice. While gościnność translates as hospitality, term used in relation to various intercultural encounters, its meaning goes much further and makes the terms like hosts and guests, key in hospitality theories, irrelevant. In other words, gościnność on a meta level exemplifies Eva Karpinski's and Yazin Nurami's, amongst others, critique of an assumed translatability of languages and cultures they communicate and their interchangeability and equivalences, which ignore hard edges of difference. The idea that languages simply translate from one another, and I am purposely overstating here, are rooted in standard language ideology, which imagines, says Ulrika Vogel, that a language is uniform and within clear boundaries, which are resistant to change. And in addition, a language has its own one best variety. It has a higher prestige, which in turn exchanges into a social, political and cultural capital standard language and cultures expressed in it and more resources to its development. Standard ideologies, as argued by Susan Gall, both shape and hide one's practices towards difference. In England, there is RP. In Polish, we have a standard Polish. These standards are obviously nourished through and at the same time nourish prevailing and historically underpinned structures of power. In standard language paradigm, the understanding of every word and fixing meaning is presented as necessary to communicate. You are meant to feel closer with the ones you understand. In other words, recognition of words and their meanings is confused with the intelligibility, which according to linguistics is a multi-stage and a dynamic process in which the importance of understanding words has been traditionally overrated. Translanguaging challenges standard language ideology. Translingual as a term was coined by Stephen Kellman to refer to artists working in non-native languages or in a mix of languages. Developed from that, translanguaging refers to, quote, complexes of situated, processual and interactional communicative practices, end quote, that individuals engage with to make sense of and organize their lives when they operate in linguistic contexts which they perceive as foreign or multiple.
Translanguaging is a receptive strategy that multilingual situations both develop and require. It includes getting into a body and communication based on nonverbal signs such as pause, body movement, gesture, intonation, but also similarity of words in different languages or broader contexts. I will let Claire to explain some other terms we will use and gaps in knowledge we are speaking to. Yeah, within this theoretical framing, you may hear us call on the terms resources, varieties or features. And the reason for this is because of how the term languages has been historically used to define language as a noun, a system that you consume through education and then use throughout life. But it's been evidenced time and time again by sociolinguists, applied and educational linguists, that we transform our linguistic and embodied resources through interactions and, and such transformation is dependent on several factors, including what communities are signaling our belonging to, who we are speaking to, where and for what purpose. And these resources are undergoing shift as a result of a process. They're shifting with us, if you like. This diagram helps to visualize our terminology where linguistic varieties are embodied resources uh, sorry, linguistic varieties and embodied resources are what we draw on and any combination of these become our communicative practices. They're the how we draw on, on them. And within this process, there's always meaning being shaped, impacting both the what and the how. This conceptualization of resources speaks to translanguaging because of how language itself is conceptualized as a process of interaction, a verb rather than a noun. So now we're just going to briefly talk through some of the gaps in the literature and practice before introducing some practices of our own. So within the dramaturgy translation and performance studies practice, there is a new cutting edge research, uh, research and practice exploring multilingual dramaturgies within a global north context. However, these neither focus on minority language practices include epistemologies and forms from the global south, nor fully respond to the need for a plurality of language practices in theatre and performance. Mirzon and Puni define dramaturgies of self as reflecting their everyday alienation experienced by both migrant theatre makers and their audiences. Their suggestion that aspects of the self carry complex sets of linguistic information that can be absorbed by dramaturgies point to a change in the foci of dramaturgies as being about communication from storytellers to spectators to being about better representation of storytellers immense complexity and this indeed is a step in the direction that we're speaking from today applied performance practice or praxis in the global north works in complex linguistic conditions that many of us know about and these include actors with dynamic linguistic resources across migratory diasporic and indigenous lines and there are numerous examples of praxis where language is at the center such as working with asylum seekers and refugees faith related work the revitalization revitalization of indigenous languages and second language acquisition However, few of these aim towards inviting the various multilingualisms of everyday life into the studio or rehearsal room without language related change or impact embedded into their aims. And I'm going to let Rachel speak more about this because it's more within her field. Thank you very much, Claire. I am going to, as um, was mentioned, be talking a little bit about the gaps uh, in drama in education. So there has, in Australia, where which is the context where I'm working, there is a vast development for drama and second language learning. And I also am looking through the participants here and I know that there are a number of people who work in this field and I acknowledge the work that you do. Embedding drama pedagogies as a tool for facilitating oral language development, reading comprehension, writing and listening skills is used in many, many projects, conducted in schools and communities. And as I said, I recognise those of you who do this, so that work as well. It does through many, many different strategies, including through games, through in-roll activities, through asking learners to think through complex language problems while on their feet. 
Drama, as we know, can be a benefit to developing decoding skills, fluency, vocabulary, synactic knowledge, discourse knowledge, and increased motivation and reduced anxiety, all of these mentioned by Rieg and Parquette in 2009. The absorption of play that occurs, with, uh, that occurs for learners within the drama for additional language development environment creates opportunities for pre comprehension skills to be developed in proposed languages. Additionally, Piazzoli reflects on the ways that enhanced intercultural awareness. Sorry, everyone. Um, um, I've just lost my place. Sorry. Uh, that um, advanced intercultural um, awareness uh, can be part of the language development pro process. Her contention is that a student's cultural perception may be heightened through additional language development through drama. Her insights also extend how culture aids language development during drama pedagogies, bolstering this discussion at hand. There are many several places for gaps that lie in the criticality of effect in translanguaging situations. How strategies and sensory experiences of effect are enhanced through critical moments of embodied translanguaging and language development strategies is something that I'll be discussing in relation to some of my projects later. I'll now move on to talking about the methodologies that we'll be discussing today. The three of us use a range of mixed methods which speaks to our different differentiating field. Kasha draws on performance analysis to analyze the place of gosh and nosh within actors' interactions and bodies. This approach draws from research in multilingual dramaturgies and translation. Claire advances her interactional and socio interactional sociolinguistic and performance studies approach, which analyzes what is signaled by the body in connection with beliefs and attitudes to languages in their context. This approach continues her analytical, analytical and methodological connections between sociolinguistics, actor training and applied performance. I research through drama education studies, framing and sorry, and dance education studies as well, which looks at transformative, transformational pedagogies in connection with identity, informing research in drama and dance and education. I use ethnographic observation of learning environments, as well as work sample analysis to arrive at findings about language and culture in the dance and drama classroom. I use narrative inquiry and focus group with participants to explore the ways that culture and personal development of confidence and connection to the learning environment can be enhanced, be enhanced in, by movement in the multilingual classroom. I am speaking as a storyteller and scholar, and my discussion is not based on objective facts, but practitioners speaking about their practice. There is a limit to which one can rely on the author's accounts of their work. However, critically multilingual contexts remind one that regardless of our distance, neutrality, criticality, there is always a focal point in our gaze. Our ears are tuned to certain frequencies. In multilingual contexts, we are never neutral and should follow examples of Judith Butler, Alison Phipps, Jana Merzon, Katia Frimberg, Claire French, and do what Judith Butler calls to give an account of oneself in relation to vexed social and linguistic condition. And in a sense, facilitating gościnność in a room starts with precisely that. So from acknowledging the vexed social and linguistic condition in the room and creating a space for trying to give up modes of working based on standard language ideology, translatability and simplistic and paradoxically misunderstood ideas of intelligibility. As a storyteller, I start my every session of Polish storytelling, which I usually deliver in Ireland and the UK, so in context dominated by English language and expected to be in English, in Polish. I talk to audience in Polish, welcoming them and introducing myself. I use gestures to support what I say. I intentionally take this Polish intro as far as I start feeling awkward. The idea is to emphasize what Claudia Nascimento describes as, quote, double foreignness, end quote, of actors whose cultural reality is no longer the one prescribed by a perfect juxtaposition of national and ethnic boundaries. The performer is, quote, seen as a foreigner by her social and professional environment and spectators. And at the same time, the actors perceives these environments and her audiences as unfamiliar, end quote. 
I also cast the audience as foreigners. I am emphasizing this double foreignness to spotlight all mechanisms, such as translation, in operation to bring the tra Polish traditional texts and legends to English speaking audience, to get the audience to try to figure out what's happening and allow a potential that there is someone in the audience who understands. I follow with explaining to audience what I said in Polish and getting them to say it, or more specifically, I uh, get them to say hello in Polish, so dzień dobry, and my name is so, nazywam się. I don't correct anyone who doesn't ask, and we enact the simple welcoming someone in Polish in Paris, no, it's like a simple drama game. It is not about them speaking perfect Polish, but about playing and experiencing Polish sounds in their mouth and bodies. The idea of play and embodied experience brings me to my second example, this time from Czechia and Germany, and specifically theater network Czech theater network Bohemia Bavaria, an established cross-border theater network that works with young people in Germany and Czechia. It uses multilingual pedagogy called Czech as a way to explore language, culture, history, and future of the Czech-German border, but also to facilitate inclusivity in theater and broader contexts, such as disability. A Czech means Czech and Deutsch. Czech in Czech is Czeski, and German in German is Deutsch. The network focuses on ages from 14 to 21, mostly from the rural areas close to the border, but separated through history and through the Iron Curtain between West Germany and Czechoslovakia in particular. This, as Kristina Werner, a German early career theatre practitioner and pedagogue of Russian descent, reflects, has led to many prejudices. So, choice is about reinvestigating culture of being together in reciprocal difference, or more accurately, culture of gościnność. Practically, this involves ensuring that the projects are always run by two facilitators, one German and one Czech, so the participants don't have to speak each other languages and can speak their language of choice. However, there is no translation and the process itself involves playing with languages of the other uh, uh, of the other languages and focus is on using languages creatively rather than getting it right, says Werner, getting the sounds and the feels of languages in the body. Like in a song, for example, which is written uh, in language or which is written following the dictionary called Toyj. It's a dictionary made of new words made by different participants throughout different projects. So there is that transgenerational aspect of it that's playing on the two languages. So those of you that speak German uh, or Czech uh, or both can uh, can appreciate how the words are mixed. But as an example, uh, word danku you in Czech means thank you, and it is building on German danke and in Czech danku you, which both means thank you. In the productions that the participants create, they both use languages and uh, Czech, and their shared core principle is that German speaking audiences will not understand the same thing as the Czech speaking audience or as someone who speaks both languages. So again, the difference is written as a core value of the process and the performance. And Werner, who has worked internationally, has used these principles when working as a dramaturg and co-director of 2017 Jala which means a green meadow at Litvanos Nationalities Dramos Teatras, so Lithuanian National Drama Theatre in Vilnius. Other creators were Kristina Savitskine, Jonas Tertelis, and Rimantas Rybatsiaukos. Jala Piewiele explores stories of workers from Ignalinos Autonomy Electrina, so Ignalina nuclear power plant, opened in 1980s in the city of Izaginas, only to be closed in 2004 due to the EU regulations and as a condition of Lithuania joining the EU. Jala Piewiele features stories of people who first built, worked at, and then had to dismantle the plant as it was too similar to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Jala Piewiele performed through interactions between Russian, Lithuanian, and English, and those languages reflect the diversity uh, in Visaginas, which I try to, you know, visualize through that picture. Uh, stages a clash between the EU ideals and local perspectives. In doing so, it echoes broader European debates on EU regulations and its impact on local industries and communities, and the importance of environmental policies and environmental focused European citizenship. The presence of Russian on the Lithuanian national stage is politically charged. Jala Pieville was devised through drama workshops with residents of Visaginas near the plant. 
they also performed it, which was the first case of non-professional actors performing in the Lithuanian National Theatre. And side note, the concept of professional actor in Eastern Europe is institutionally so legally defined uh, and it's related to drama school training. And if anybody is interested, I'm very happy to reflect on it after. The process was long, over six months, and started with several prejudices and preconceptions, not between the residents who came from many different cultural backgrounds, different levels of education, different mother tongues, different generations, but between the creators from the National Theatre and the residents. In fact, the expected conflict or rift between Visaginas communities was one of the prejudices initially held by the directors and dramaturgs. What broke the initial mistrust was stopping theatre process and starting conversations with tea and cake. But the breakthrough came out of language failure. Initially, Werner facilitated meetings in English and the process involved a translator, something which she said did not feel right. She felt her voice was being mediated and was very aware of the participants responding to the translator rather than her as facilitator. An alternative occurred by coincidence and was then used in the process after that. One day translator was missing and Werner found herself speaking mixing Russian and English, missing certain words. The group responded throwing words in Lithuanian for those that needed extra translation, hands gestures were used. This multilingual environment created different dynamics, quote, everybody started using all three languages all the time. They accommodated each other, so everybody felt comfortable with it, end quote. This space was the space of gościnność, facilitated by all through their differences and inviting each other's differences. And in turn, that created space for the actors, many without any previous theater experience, where they could trust each other and the dramaturgical and directorial team, and what Werner stressed was the most difficult, they could say no to creative choices and take ownership of their monologues. The play was a college of monologues about Visagina, although the dramaturgical and directing team still structured and structured the production. The event has also translated into the dramaturgical structure of the show. Jala Pieville starts with Helen Riding speaking in English because she represents people in the European Commission, but also to stress the presence of the outsider's perspective in the play and limitation it has, which was later confronted with the stories of local communities. In other words, English often presented as the global cultural interpreter and condition for international engagement. In Jala Pieville became the language symbolizing the limitation of understanding. These techniques that I described focus precisely on inviting one to feel another language in one's body in a way that is not despite the limitation of understanding, but possible because of these limitations and failures. And I now pass to Claire. So now that we're in the body, I'm going to briefly discuss some techniques or methodologies to facilitate actors to stay in their bodies and continue the circular process of being in the body and translanguaging. Director Sibusisa Mkhizi. In a recent multilingual devising project at the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, to find rhythm for actors, saying, So there's this thing that we hear, stump stump, and the right between this and this, there is a presence of time, right? Here he lays out the definition of an interval as it's known in English, for rhythm or a, a pattern to be present, there must be an interval. He adds, we know when a certain time count passes, there will be a sound. When a certain time count passes, this thing will sound again. Now we could also think about this in terms of the rhythm of life. You know that as, at a certain time, something will happen. When it does not happen at the time, we know that rhythm, the pattern, will be disturbed. Sibusiso's examination of the concept of rhythm was introduced into a process that adapted postmodern choreographer Mary Overley's viewpoints for devising autobiographical performance. Such viewpoints include space, shape, time, emotion, movement, and story. These are all compositional tools for focusing the body on listening and responding to stimuli, catalyzing translanguaging. Central to the viewpoints is a notion of deconstruction, 
Actors are not acting and contributing, but responding to what's already there. A close focus, presence, and willingness to continue to take, exp uh, take explorations in new directions is essential for this work. Presence is defined here as a generation and transfer of energy. At least two types of presence are refined, an inward looking to one's own resources and an outward looking to seeing peer actors' resources as shared and building on them in situ. For example, the actor may tune their body to explore impulses in the way that space is contorted by traveling behind an actor running along the boundary of their, of their body cast in the shadows of the sand through presence to the actor and to the space. This exploration may shift into being emotion-based where the other actor becoming aware of the collaboration may collapse in stages to the ground, splaying their hands and feet and crawling towards the actor. They may be investigating emotion through gaze toward the actor, a sense of weight, experienced by the body. And they may also be focusing on story, turning into a lizard, for example, that creeps towards their stalker. These improvisations continue on and on <laughs> for something, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 30, depending on what is being sought by the group and the director. Now, if we return to Sibusiso's notion of rhythm, it might be seen as marrying quite well with Overly's viewpoints. The idea that actors have at their disposal the option to continue the smooth running of the interval, distort it, and add to it, is in itself a process of being and deconstruction. Actors are being as they are waiting for the natural interval emerging, as well as having a second ear to the ground for disrupting the interval. Rhythm is therefore a useful formulation for all the viewpoints and one that suits Sibu Siso's Johannesburg-based Izi Zulu and African context. Olubenga Olusola Elijah de Taiwo defines the African and more specifically Yoruba embodied understanding of rhythm and time. He describes the inner experience of rhythm as an organizing structure for the expression of physical movement. He proposes that the African curved view of time differs from the Western linear one and in, and in how the interval is generative and reflective and therefore cyclical. The performer's body is shaped by transcultural impulses in concert with other actors, but they are in effect shaping these impulses creating cyclicality be be between doing in the body and these points of reflection. And this view fits very well with Sibu Sisu's view of rhythm for the actors and how they come to explore rhythm in devising. And I'm going to look now at two brief examples of how rhythm is developed as a catalyst for translanguaging. So, Actors non Vuyu and non Tlatla are University of the Witwatersrand performance students and explored rhythm with Sibu Siso uh, in a language consciousness raising and tra training elements of a performance project for language revitalization in 2021. I'm going to show you two examples of their exploration of rhythm in the fifth rehearsal. In this rehearsal, they were set the task of drawing from the viewpoints while responding to autobiographical poems written by non Fafla and another actor, Moa Ketsi, through a loudspeaker on the outdoor grounds of the University of the Witwatersrand. Rand. In the first example, they're responding to Moa Ketsi's poem, which is about one and a half minutes long and being played repeatedly for some 30 minutes before this moment. The actors are tired, but they're still managing to listen to each other, to Mo Ketsi's words and to the space. <laughs> See the actors here are placing their gaze towards the limbs of their body, as if caressing themselves, caring for themselves, 
Movements are soft and sweeping to fit the sounds of Moaketsi's poem. This is a praise poem that draws from his sesutu, and it's about his father's community. It tells the story of his grandfather protecting his family from a hippo, and the poem is reaching its end at this point, where he slayed the hippo and being, and being held in high regard by the rest of the community. The actor's care and caress of their limbs may be in response to the pride felt by Mo Moaketsi when he reaches this moment in the poem. They slow their responses as the poem reaches its end, meeting one of the endpoints that Sibusiso discusses in his conceptualization of rhythm. Here, an easy interval to dem demarcate for the actors is the poem itself, its start and end points, the, the repeating pause for the interval. The actors in many ways are surrendering to this as, as the rhythm and not imposing much more on it at this particular moment. And in a viewpoint's language, they would, this would be a point where the facilitator might move the actors on so that they can refresh and undo and seek the next stimuli. But Sibu Siso, as a cinematographer and the, and the director, continues it, waiting for the beginning of the next repetition of the poem to see what it does for them. So as the poem begins again here, actors find something new between each other, a tug of war between them, as the words of the poem describe his grandfather's plight in having the hippo there to both protect them and threaten them. They each embody these two sides to leave the hippo, to leave the threat, or to be rid of it, as the two sides of the grandfather himself. The exploration is new and fresh, and they're both present to one another, to continue to develop it and to feel it. Rhythm, however, is fairly set. Now look at this excerpt in comparison. This is from a collaboration that was much earlier in the day, when they, when they included Moaketsi drumming alongside Nonflatla's poem, creating new variations on the rhythm being offered from the poem. Nanflata is seen exploring the rhythm of the words in her body here, rolling her shoulders and chest as if the gaps between each word offered their own intervals. Nanfuya has her hand fixed, and both her and Nanflata's gaze is attached to it. Also, the djembe beat changes, and Nanfuya uses, uses it as an opportunity to respond to this new rhythm with her hand. Nanflata following, using the hands like they're a conductor and she's an instrument to develop a new idea with this. To begin, this is just one finger or hand flick as stimuli for one physical pull in a direction, mostly using her chest, back and shoulders. Here she begins to use the hand flicks as stimuli for a whole series of movements, which they eventually draw on each other to mirror and extend.
Thus, the variation in the drumming, in addition to the layer of audible poetry, provides new stimuli for disrupting and transforming the interval, changing the rhythm. The curved rhythm, suggested by Elijah Taiwo, is seen in how the golden triangle of voice, drumming, and dance provides provide chances for one to impact the other. Reflection is made in the body, which changes the shape of the other forms and allows the musician to also respond in situ. So what does this have to do with translanguaging? In these examples, actors not only use each other's linguistic resources as base rhythms, but each other's personal stories about themselves written into their own constructed rhythm of a poem. Thus, there are multiple levels of translanguaging here as peer actors respond in their own bodies to their peers' rhythm of language, voice, poem, and orality. While this can be observed in the first video, they are quite passively going with these rhythms rather than constructing their own in addition. In the latter video, actors are disrupting the, the rhythm of Nan Shlafla's poem, creating their own intervals with the leadership of the djembe. The curved rhythm also means that, that there is not real leadership here, but a dialogic interaction that is characterized by close listening. They use the drum as an opportunity to speak back to the poem in their bodies. In this moment, actors are present to multiple stimuli, the poem, the drum, each other, the camera held by Sibu Siso, and they are trying to go further with creating rhythms as a metaphor for their own voices, articulations of the poem and linguistic resources. If translanguaging is accepting difference and not knowing as the things that bring us together, then these responses can be understood as embodiments of such. Importantly, these are not linguistic resources that are in the actor's repertoire. They know smatterings of each other's languages, but in this moment, they're familiar and at ease, active and speaking back. They make their peer intelligible through articulating rhythms that both echo the existing linguistic resources and poem, as well as exist in dialogue with them. Actors speak on behalf of in their body, as seen in example one, as well as simultaneously speaking back to the voice driving the poem. And this creates a process of familiarity that exists within translanguaging, where those interacting are at ease with their contribution despite not knowing. It returns us to the unity of the self and one's resources that's also so central to decolonizing African performance. Thank you, Claire. I'll continue by talking a little bit about um, some advancements in language that are enhanced by engagement of the body in space and through effective response. I work in a few different ways. I am a South Asian dancer. I run an Indian Bollywood dance school and I'm beginning to use this medium as a method to develop English language skills in South Asian, so, so in South Asian diasporas, namely in different Indian communities. So I'll give you a start with a small description of how dance creates an impulse for language. A lot of what I do looks like quite a traditional dance class, quite a, what I would do in one of my community Bollywood classes. And the majority of strategies that are used here are dance and movement based. And the advantage of that is means that speakers of any language can understand the instructions and participate really successfully in the whole class. But it is important that we work in multiple languages in dance, acknowledging the language diversity of South Asia and particularly uh, India, where I'm from. So an example of that is I think um, a lot of people know that India is incredibly diverse. It is a collection of many different countries and communities, and there are hundreds of languages uh, that are spoken every day in India. In my own home where I grew up, my mother spoke Hindi, my father spoke Bengali, and we settled on English as a medium for my brother and I uh, to grow up with as a first language. And I recognize the supremacy of, um, of English in um, that context and all the pitfalls of colonization that have led to my parents making that decision, which is not something I'll go into analyzing today. But I grew up with a lot of language diversity around me, and it was really important that that was represented through my dance practice. So something we do to acknowledge that is, um, as Kaja mentioned in her practice, we start by acknowledging the language diversity that is in the room. And we ask everyone to bring that language diversity with them, not to minimize 
um, their language background. Using movements, we try to enhance uh, understandings of different words and terms through multilingual understandings. So we might take the name of the song or we might take a particular concept that's being explored in a particular Bollywood song that we're doing or a theme and we ask everybody what is this in your own community language. And we um, explore those then through movements. What are some movements that go with that? We move on to another term uh, that we're going to explore and we do the same process. And then importantly, we get people to put together the terms in an order that they think makes sense um, both in linguistic terms, you know, something that might make sense poetically or might make sense in a sentence, but also aesthetically through the body, movements that go together and flow together. And what we result in is a, hopefully a beautiful um, sequence of movements that have been created by the participants uh, that have been explored through language. It is their own creation. Part of what I'm also trying to do is disrupt the nature and order of the traditional dance classroom in the way I work. So if any of you have been to a traditional dance classroom, there is a teacher at the front and you will follow their movements. Um, it is very a highly teacher directed, um, a highly teacher directed environment. And by the way, I do regularly work in that way in my community dance classes, uh, which is an expectation that people have is that when they come to my Bollywood classes, they will leave knowing a Bollywood routine that they could then um, replicate or practice at home. So this is a different way of working. Um, so what we're doing with this program, it's, um, this trial program, is seeing if um, language can really um, spark different impulses through using our bodies, and if bodies can spark different impulses in language as well. Another possibility for this program, which has been discussed, is there. Um, I have many um, different students of many different cultures who are interested in learning Hindi. Uh, and I'm not a speaker of Hindi myself, and I'm definitely interested as well. So we're looking at a partnership program between me and my mum, uh, in which she does some language instruction and I do some dance instruction. And we work together to form some basic introduction to Hindi that might get people started. So if you think that sounds exciting, um, then please, please come and see me in my dance classroom or maybe give me your feedback about that. Uh, another way of working, as I've mentioned, is through drama. And I've recently done some analysis on the intersection between culture, effect, embodiment and language development in the multilingual classroom. A program that I'm evaluating, evaluating is a drama and transitional project in Sydney schools. It's called Transitions. It was developed by Hannah Grant from Collective Impact Arts. There's a general movement towards embodiment and effect within contemporary language and development classes, but it hasn't been catalyzed by drama educators or the field at large. A recent contribution by Dunn, Bundy and Stinson has focused on the, um, has focused on the thorough analysis of motion within um, different dramas such as process drama. They draw on Bolton's various experiences of effective memories and emotion within process drama to analyse students' commitment and connection to the work as to emotional principles. The program that I'm evaluating takes place in Sydney schools and students uh, from different language backgrounds are engaged in a targeted language program that helps develop their English language skills. And this program is a discrete nine-week program. There are no pre or post benchmarking tests as part of this program, so it is difficult to ascertain the advances that are made in different, um, in, in particular things like vocabulary or sentence structure um, or reading and writing skills. But we are looking at developing confidence and the ability of students to transition to mainstream English dominant classrooms. The strategies used also use visual arts, which I'll talk about um, using um, some examples and performative drama. Transition does it is not aimed at making structural advances in language or grammatical knowledge. It's actually not badged as a language program. It's actually badged as a learning program about confidence in speaking and listening and connecting to other learners in the learning environment, personal resilience and aiding the ease of transitions to um, in institutions like 
schools rather than being pure language development. However, translanguaging is definitely one of the underpinning philosophies of the program and translanguaging ways of working are regularly used. Even so, even though it's not a pure language program, in observations, the researcher and the teachers note small improvements in students' phonemic awareness and word recognition. By the end of this program, students are reading more fluently from scripts, they're developing their own short pieces of written dialogue, and they are performing with far more confidence than when they started. The, however, the study's most prominent advancement was noted in students' soft skills. I'm going to show you some images now, so if we go to the first image, um, yes, thank you, thank you, Claire. And I'll start just by telling you a bit about the images that we're working with here. So these images were created by an artist, Georgia Freebody, who um, lives in Sydney. And Georgia is invited into the program because there are many students in this program from forced migration backgrounds and refugee backgrounds, and they have protected identities, meaning they can't be filmed, they can't be photographed. And so to capture some of the key moments, we decided to work alongside an artist. So Georgia Freebody comes in and we engage the students in some visual art strategies that aids all the aims of the program. Um, but, and Georgia also explains the way that she'll be working, that she does gesture drawing, so quick drawing, when students are working in and both out of role. Um, and Georgia takes those sketchings away of those key and pivotal moments and in consultation with the facilitator decides on which key moments are going to be worked into artworks such as these ones. The artworks are then returned back to the students and their reactions to the artworks are then noted. While this began as a strategy to capture some of what happens in the classroom um, without the aid of photos or videos, it actually became a really great analytical strategy in itself. And I'll tell you a little bit about the images we're seeing. So firstly, this image, first image here, captures students of various age groups. They're engaged in free-flowing discussion about the development of their performance. This moment occurred early in the program. I think it was week one or two, and students were very unaccustomed to working in this way, in an embodied way. But collaboratively, they felt free to exchange ideas. They wanted to lead the direction or of the drama, or they wanted to be led by others. You can see in this image here, you can see um, some examples through their body language of some students being led by others and others taking a leadership role. The students were observed in this moment moving seamlessly in and out of role, and the teachers commented that they appeared comfortable with students of a different language group in ways they had not seen before. The open body language and the eye contact depicted in this image suggest that students are able to sustain their interest in working collaboratively on drama tasks when they are up and standing and embodying. Their ways of working in transitions are effective as a result of play, and the cultural aptitudes that are being developed uh, um, by working in this way are really strong. Transitions draws on the Vygotskyan theory of play in which dual effect is sustained. Students in transitions are encouraged to play and experiment in improvise in role. And they're working often in the tactical ways um, in which their play context may be different from their actual context. Although in studies similar to this, Vygotsky was referring to younger children. This theory has been widely applied to learners of all ages. Playful engagements began in transitions first sessions, where students are engaged straight up in small games that do things like expand their vocabulary and build their storytelling experiences. And all the strategies are designed to establish a safe entry point into ways of working in drama. The opportunities for play decrease their inhibitions allowing students to experience drama strategies with their senses, influencing affect, um, as you can see through the artworks. In this image, you can see moments of cohesion. You can see focus. You can see respect to the speaker that can be seen here. And these were things that the, that the teachers said hadn't happened in previous classes when students were grouped with people from different language groups. In order to have the cohesion that comes from this sensory experience of effect, the embodiment was really necessary to drive that. Um, 
Transitions engages effect with translanguaging pedagogies in that students are accessing all of their linguistic repertoires or that at least is the aim of the program. Students engage with themes of transitioning to high school, growth, socialisation, hope and fear throughout the program. But these are intertwined with effect. Effect is intimately connected with bodily presence and experience, the which were heightened through the drama, drama pedagogies. In the focus groups afterwards, students explained that they had not previously worked in this way. They found it different and a challenging way to work. One student said, games were fun and I like them, but they were also very hard because they made you talk and made you think. Sometimes in other classes, you can pretend to be learning, but not in this. And at this point, I will go yet yeah, have a, um, do an exploration of this image of the students with their heads in their hands walking around. Students arrive at ways to express themselves in drama through playful means. And this playful pedagogy is observed through students' ability to take risks, which gradually improved over the nine weeks. And one of these moments was captured by George's Freebody, where we did a role walk. It's quite simple. It was part of a warm-up strategy. Students were asked to walk the space, expressing different emotions, such as happiness, joy, sadness, or despair. This, in this image, they were asked to walk as if they were upset or crying. A group of students were unable to embody this emotion and they completely erupted into laughter. They laughed so much that they leaned in to hide their faces in their hands or in their shirts to muffle their laugh. Laughter is an effective response within the body. It's a precognitive bodily response to the senses. In this instance, the student's laughter is an effective response to the conditions of the drama strategies. Although the laughter is resistant to the emotion that was asked of them, it suggests that there's a close listening cohesion between students in this moment. As students engage in bodily responsive laughter, they sense solidarity with one another. In the moments that followed, the students were asked to reflect on their in-role strategy, which um, prompted them into a consciousness around their effect in this instance. This consciousness created opportunities for understanding of previous effective moments to be attached to their personal cultures, increasing their cultural aptitudes. They're collectively surrendering together. You can see their bodies moving forward. You can see the effect at work. Translanguaging allows cohesion in this moment, showing that emotion, um, showing emotion without, um, without, without replicating the feeling that we were asking them, but having a sense of unity between them. This effective moment is really pivotal. There's solidarity here. There's certainly a hospitality that welcomes that every response is evident. What was really beautiful is when Georgia Freebody came back and presented them with the image and they ran over to the image and they leaned out to touch it and they identified themselves and they say, look, miss, we're seeing they're being upset. We're crying. You can see it. Even though that wasn't the image, that wasn't the response that they were giving us at the time, they could still see shades of these different um, shades of these different emotions through their bodily movements and through their translanguaging experiences. And at this point, I will hand um, I will hand over to a discussion about uh, the future and what this means for our practices. So rather than conclusion, uh, knowing we will be running uh, just on the borderline of time, we propose uh, to end by asking you uh, two questions. What does this panel mean for your practices? And what are the context relevant specifics of our projects that limit opportunities for borrowing from them? Thank you. So thank you very, very much indeed to the, the three um, panelists. And, and what a lovely way to end by asking questions uh, for the for the other people who are who are here so can i invite um other people in the session so we've got i think natalie we've got a hand up so natalie could you um share your response thank you um yeah that gets me thinking of a project that i'm currently working on in terms of how in the english classroom teachers can actually support students multilingual backgrounds um, especially when curriculum focuses a lot on english as the standard that is perceived as higher. Um, but 
that's a different uh, that's a different aspect. But I was interested, Rachel, in terms of in that project you're talking about, in what what examples can you give where students brought their cultural practices to bear on the interactions or the experiences in the space? Yeah, thanks, Nelly. Can I ask, um, are you referring to the dance program or the drama program or possibly both of them? Yeah, just yeah, the, the ones with the artwork. Oh, the ones with the artwork. Yeah. Um, so it is um, definitely a program about their transition to mainstream classroom. And so we're definitely asking them from their experience um, what they're looking forward to, what they're looking forward um, what their trepidation is, what are some of their concerns when they move to the next stage of their learning. And so what mostly gets um, discussed in that, in that scenario is separation with the cultural groupings, the linguistic groupings that they have in their current learning environment. And this is something that we ask them to, um, to bring to the environment and say, tell us about those. Tell us about those experiences that you that you treasure deeply. Tell us about what you bring when you're interacting with people from your own language group or from your own culture or even from your own school that you hold deep. And what are some of those practices that you are afraid of losing in the next transition to learning? So that's one example. Um, we definitely um, their linguistic. Diversity. We try not to minimise other languages in the classroom. We engage with um, how is this simple strategies like how is this said or expressed or you know how is this um, ritual shared? You know how are you used to working in this way? So um, I guess the overall theme of the program, as well as some of those micro moments in terms of you know linguistic terms or or ways of culturally engaging with each other. Thank you. I just okay, wanted to say that I am, yeah, just to comment, Natalie, I'm so grateful you made that link about English. I'm, you know, like I'm raising a bilingual child in the UK and uh, that that standard of English, both from my experience from nursery, but also talking to other parents. Um, and when, you know, in older years, dyslexia has been missed because it is put on all oh, his or she is multilingual, uh, but also uh, interaction with schools, because I run a lot of applied, you know, modules when I interact with schools, when when some teachers and some principals perceive multilingualism as equal to some sort of other deprivation. So they put it in a line of deprivation. And there was also a call from um, it came from Poland, but it was international uh, uh, from psychiatrists, children development, uh, scientists, education uh, practitioners and specialists based on research calling to stop recognizing uh, one language, ability to speak one language, so monolingualism as a norm and start uh, looking at multilingualism as a norm, because otherwise they're, they're all apparently this is, you know, different standards, different way the brain develops is just very different. It's not better or worse. It's just very different. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you for sharing. And thank you very much for that, that comment, Kasra. I think that idea of multilingualism being treated through a kind of deficit model is, is a huge. You, know, you could probably see me shaking my, shaking my head when you were saying that. Yeah, it's still very depressing kind of reality. Um, do we have any other, so I can see, um, Natalie, um, is that a, a legacy hand or do you have um, a new point you'd like to add? I thought my hand was down, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, I mean, please do take this opportunity to add something else if you'd like to. No, okay. Um, do we have any other um, comments from anyone else who's who's here? Any other responses, especially to these two prompts about what this might mean for, for your or our practice and what are the kind of context relevant specifics of, of our, your projects that limit opportunities for, for borrowing from them? What about the South Africans watching? Do the So perhaps, perhaps while while people are sorry, I've got um, 
Not so, yeah, there's a, there's a small person um, making interruptions in the background. Um, hello, small yeah. person. Yeah, they're saying hello, Phoebe. She's smiling. Um, yeah, so just maybe while other people in the audience are, are kind of formulating their their thoughts as well, I think one of the things that really um, struck me, actually, Rachel, was about your um, your response to what would seem to be a a problem, a real challenge initially of not being able to, you know, video record um, what was what was actually going on because you know um, of the the children kind of being in protected protected categories and stuff. And as as someone who does um, conversation analysis, you know, typically we record but then disguise it in other ways um sometimes quite creatively but sometimes in quite an ugly way where it makes it quite difficult to see what's going on and i just thought um and i could see some other people in the chat kind of really responding to those those um artworks that were produced to capture these moments so i think the kind of this is where the the sort of creative performative practices that that we have within drama education and applied theater i think can add a really interesting dimension so you know moving moving past what might be a problem to actually building in that other layer of, of interpretation so i just wondered would you be able to say a little bit more about about some of your experiences with using that i'd love to thank you uh thank you so much um and you, you know it's one of those things that you know that just add art and i don't mean to simplify it to that but if there's a problem you know how can an artist solve it um, because what we did was this was a, just a simple question of how are we going to capture moments but also when we go to present the work if we've got no photos or videos and things like that we know at forums like these it just brings so much to it so we thought we'll get an artist in and we really thought that was something to the side what having an artist did Firstly, with doing gesture drawings and um, gesture drawings, I'm not from visual arts field, so I had to learn, are quite stark and they're just about figures and proximity and movement and things like that. We brought them back to the students and they spent all the time trying to figure out who was who and they said, Miss, we don't, um, um, there's no faces on these. And they were kind of disappointed. And we explained, we were like, well, we're actually not able to identify you. And they're like, yeah, but you can do something. And the artist went away and went, yeah, I can do something. And so made it quite a generic look on them that you can't identify the students and say who is who. But it is more representative of the person. Um, and that was a really important moment for us is that nobody is a hollow figure. We are all full people. Also, what um, the artist brought to the environment, brought to the environment was another analytical lens. And we are drilling down what makes the artist capture that particular moment, what makes that a pivotal moment according to the artist. Um, and I do need to acknowledge that this technique, in my experience, um, in my knowledge, um, the first time I saw it was by Erica Piazzoli, who was using it in the Sorgente program working in Ireland and um, it was actually that's where the idea um, what sparked my idea was the gesture drawings in that environment and so um, acknowledging that work was used there first and very successfully um, and very beautifully to illustrate some of those pivotal moments where movement and um, language development are working hand in hand. Brilliant, thank you. No, I mean it's it's there's lots of kind of ideas going around my head uh, about this. It's it's really really interesting. So um, because I don't think we've got too long until lunch now. Do we have any other comments from Claire? Do you want to? I just want to because it highlights you know the the illustrations highlight the limitations of our field, right? And and that's also what I was thinking. Obviously, when I was putting my presentation together and also my new scholars presentation on Tuesday which discussed the same project is that I was working in an English only in terms of policy um, institution but because I was being funded from a postdoc that was well it was from within the institution but it was also from an American funder it meant that I could 
really do whatever I wanted. You know, I didn't have to deal with the curricula, which is obviously this enormous loophole, which means that my this project, you couldn't ever possibly try to replicate in the classroom, right? Um, so I think that's what, what like, Kasha and I were also interested in talking about the limitations for, because it's like, we talk about these projects and you go, yeah, great, but I don't know how I could ever make that happen based on the limitations, right? And so I think that's why we're also interested in talking about these um, between disciplines because Kasha, Rachel and I are all from different disciplines which are intersecting somehow and, and we can learn from each other's practices without necessarily borrowing from them, right? Mm. And I think this is also very much I'm interested in, like pushing against this kind of canonized way of thinking where we're grabbing Boal or grabbing Stanislavski because it's ancient and it's kind of silly and... <laughs> And, and also, really which Stanislavski, you now this is from theater, which Stanislavski, from which year are we borrowing him? Like, <laughs> work, like, work with what you've got there in front of you, your actors and the contacts and your cultures, you know, and I think that's very much a, the activist kind of that's pushing this through um, to fruition, this, this, this panel. So, yeah, that's, that's all. Yeah, and if, if I can just... <laughs> If I may just kind of jump in um, there as well, it, it was making me, whether we're thinking about kind of the curricula, about assessment or about how we kind of, you know, compartmentalise research specialities and stuff like this. I think one of the things that came through from all of you was the significance of in multilingual practice, the fact that not everyone is going to understand everything, whether that's the researcher, doesn't understand everything, whether it's, you know, um, so Claire, in, in your case, you've talked about this, whether it's the, um, you know, the practitioner, so Rachel, you were saying about having to get your mum <laughs> involved to do the the, the Hindi, um, or, or Kasha, the fact that, you know, you'll have audience members, and if they only speak Czech or only speak German, or if they speak both, they're going to have a completely different response to this. And I mean, this, this seems to be one of the, you know, great things that this this practice offers but also one of the challenges of how we kind of fit this complexity and messiness into what want to be very discreet clean categories either for for teaching or, or research so um we've we've hit what is supposed to be i think the end of our session but do we have any other comments from the the um audience or co-participants or any of the the panelists can so I just jump finish? in, everyone? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sure. can, um, is it with apologies, everyone? I can't see the chat. Um, so if there were any questions or anything like that or anything directed towards me, I'm I'm so sorry. I have no idea why, but I can't see the chat. So um, yeah, yes, sorry about that. Apologies, Rachel. This is one of the the idiosyncrasies of teams. Um, what what I have to tell you is most of the things that are in there are actually just things like wow. Those artworks are so amazing. And Natalie's saying, great, great panel. I'm so glad I came to this. So um, clearly, you know, other people have had a very positive response to this as well. But I think, um, Ham Hamish, did you have a, a question? Or a, um, something to add? Uh, th th thanks, Duncan. I think it was more just a comment. Just, um, yeah, appreciating the sort of um, intersection that that the three, pres the th three, three, three overlapping works sort of creates. Um, Sort of, I'm 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 quiet more because of of processing thought rather than having an initial like uh, clear response. So just a lot of agreement, a lot of agreement, a lot of um, acknowledgement uh, with what we also face in the South African context, where um, Claire, as, as you would know, being at Wits as well, the sort of highly politicized space that it is, um, and and how the institution and and institutions in South Africa are sort of caught up in it, and I think. In our context, the sort of question of of, of code switching and language and the power of language um, is so is so present still in 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 the sort of current politic that you know within the practice um, it almost seems not as as loud and not to say that it's not significant, but because it, it's it's so it's such a political hotbed still it, it's almost like it, it's it's just an expectation you know. In your practice, you, you you must have this ability to be to be multilingual and function multilingually, um, particularly in, in in certain contexts of, of of work that we do in the South African context. 
And so, so some of the perspectives raised here, I think, are giving me um, language or new, new languaging or new even consideration points to just engage with as we're, we're rolling with in, in the South African context. But thank you. Really enjoying this, this conversation and the presentation. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, you. Hamish. And so we also have, um, sorry, I'm just trying to open up the, uh, we have another hand up, which may now have disappeared. <laughs> um, yes, I'm sorry. I had a hand up, but I realized that I I I, I I'm, I'm late, so oh. I, I want to respect time. Yeah. Um, uh, the session is ending now at two. Am I right? At now. Yeah. It it is, but um, I I'm yeah. I'm very reluctant to kind of cut off the conversation. What I what I would say is, and th thank you very much for that. Um, I think the idea now is from one until one thirty, we've got an opportunity for us to whatever time zone we're in, whatever food we feel like or don't feel like, whether we need a, a kind of break or, or we, we want to carry on chatting. I think the idea is that we can come together. Do you know, Claire, if it's on the, the main channel one? I think it's channel one. Yeah, um, to, to kind of have have dinner, have lunch, have breakfast. A coffee or whatever. I must admit, I have, um, in a very intercultural way, I've got here in front of me some Thai meatballs made by a Thai friend. Here, <laughs> okay, um, which which I will be enjoying. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you very very much again to the the panelists um, for a really really inspiring and kind of provocative um, talk, which I think will give us lots to think about in terms of practice, but also I think methodologically. Um, as well in terms of how we try and research this. So if we can give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who can see the chat, I'm just putting in again a link to a Padlet that we have where uh, in the spirit of mess, complexity and uncertainty, we ha will hopefully have this kind of patchwork of comments, observations, images that you can leave. Um, so if you can see the chat, please do follow that link. Um, those of you who can't, we'll try and send this maybe via email um, so that you can get that. But hopefully I will see you very soon um, for a, a bit of dinner, lunch, breakfast, coffee, whatever. Um, and also then I think we'll begin again at 1.35. But thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>